Sure, no problem. Hey everybody, I'm uh, Andy Freeborn. Today I'll be talking about uh, Windows.com, not Windows.com. I'm sure it's a wet, great website. So we'll be talking about quite a few things, but first, I uh, am an IT internal audit manager and also red team at uh, ACI. Before that, uh, did some red teaming and pen testing. Mostly memes. Uh, also, I'm on Twitter at Mandarb and uh, website. And so I'll try to keep this kind of interactive, so feel free to ask questions. Also, uh, try to answer some pictures. And I try to uh, keep the uh, C++ down to a minimum. So we'll try to see how well that works out. So we're going to talk about uh, the background of COM, kind of why it's here and why it's here to stay. And also, like the title uh, suggested, we're going to talk from this from a uh, red team perspective, as well from a uh, blue team perspective as well. So kind of get both sides rather than being red focused. Usually you see in those kind of talks, kind of give the blue teamers uh, some uh, tips and defenses as well. They can work into their platforms, or their environments, and uh, kind of use this knowledge as well from both sides to help uh, better the, uh, um, the organization. So like I said, we'll start with uh, C++. It's pretty heavy, so I hope you guys can read all this really well. So um, first you can see with this structure here for this uh, COM interface, uh, it's pretty common what you see. I'm just kidding. So background to for Windows COM stands for the uh, Component Object Model. And uh, Microsoft at the time had some problems getting some products to uh, integrate really in a not really easy way, but getting developers uh, some kind of flexibility to help be more interoperable. And so they also kind of like with the, uh, what we know today as programs could be pretty portable, that wasn't really the case back in the 90s. And so as this technology has been around for a long time, there's a lot of great books, but unfortunately they're not digital. So we associate things with Windows now with having a shell. So you see them like command shell and PowerShell. There's no real COM shell, but as we'll see, it's kind of like things we're really familiar with, with uh, .NET and WMI. And um, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty rad. We'll see why. So with a technology as old from the 90s, uh, and the idea has been around for a long time, uh, it's been around for quite a while. And so with that, it's pretty well embedded in even Windows 10 today. So with this kind of being embedded, you see really the abstractions of common interfaces from uh, the Windows operating system really not really shown as, oh, this is a common way of doing it. You just see uh, copying a file from one file from one folder to a different folder. You don't really see below the covers of how it's, being op how it's working. <coughs> or even if you embed Word files in a uh, Excel document, that's still calm but you don't really see that. It's all hidden under the covers and uh, all kind of extracted. Oh, okay. So um, as we can see here, the picture on the left, we see a whole bunch of words. Don't really matter a whole lot right now. Since my mouse no, doesn't show up. So if you can see where it says prog ID count, this number is going to be pretty relevant, uh, not right away, but Keep in mind, there's thousands of these objects here. And so with that, there's com objects everywhere. So being portable, the first, pro the first problem is to hide make it portable. And so DLLs help to package things together and make it dynamic where they could be moved across machines. And so with that, the um, different kind of models kind of surfaced out of COM with OLE and ActiveX. And so with uh, OLE, as I mentioned, was with how you would transfer files, let's say with putting Word into Excel and making that really seamless. As we can see, that's wreaked havoc with uh, even with CVEs associated with phishing uh, still being exploited today. And ActiveX, as we all know, makes IE make bad life choices. So that's been thankfully taken away for the most part. We don't really see ActiveX used quite as often, perhaps only in legacy type environments. But all that really was built on the idea of COM, just a different extension of COM kind of building on top of that. 
So COM has been talked a lot about so far, but how do we see this? Well, I mean, you might be familiar with kind of COM being used in scripts you might have downloaded, like this uh, script, for example, uh, uses the uh, scripting that file system object, COM object, and so you might have been familiar with that, or probably more recently with a wscript.shell com object. And so these are all different com objects that um, how we're using that to bubbling it up. Also, if I can say com 100 times, I get a prize. So I'm trying to bump up that, uh, that word. So you know, from here, you see a lot of VBScript. It's pretty gnarly. It's not as pretty as PowerShell. So PowerShell, thankfully, makes everything a lot simpler. So as we saw in that VB script, we had to do a lot of different manipulation. But with PowerShell, it makes it really easy to just do dollar sign com to make a new object, a uh, new object, dash com object, and wscript.shell. So we have a very simple way to consume com interfaces with a custom PowerShell object. And if we just do just print out the uh, com object itself, do, uh, dollar com, and do pipe it to get member, we can see kind of all the methods associated with this com interface. So that makes it easy for administrators and bad guys to quickly consume uh, com objects. So kind of before we get too far down that rabbit hole, taking a, a quick break from our sponsors, com really is a hot mess because you know, it's been around for a long time, they had to put it somewhere. They had to put all this configuration information somewhere where people like developers and administrators could quickly get that information and use that and get it in a reliable and uh, safe way. So naturally, the only way to put this is in the registry. As we know, that's a good place for gold mine of information. And so Windows made this special uh, class a lot of thought and care did not want to go into this. The HKEY class is root. And so this combines both the HKLM, the local machine, and the current user hives into one super hive. Now we're twice as powerful. And so this comes important later on because as a user, I can control quite a few things. And normally, when things are down into the HKLM hive, it's usually locked down. But if we have some place that a user can influence, like in the class's root, that can cause quite a few problems. And they don't also have to live in the registry. Of com objects don't have to live in the registry. They can also uh, live as uh, manifest files, like com scriptlets that we'll see uh, later on. So to break down com itself, we need to understand how different parts of com are referenced and how we can use that. So back to the prior example, we have the uh, com object wscript.shell, that interface. That's referred to as the uh, prog ID. And so that makes it like a, a simple interface way to reference a uh, com object. But additionally, you don't have to have that, that easier way. You can refer to the uh, GWT type way with the interface ID. But depending, so, but both of these are unique identifiers within the registry and other ways to be uh, referenced for any kind of opportunities. As I mentioned, there's uh, com scriptlets. Those are the uh, SCT files. And so people throw around com scriptlet, com scriptlet. But you know, we might have heard of uh, Windows com, com plus. And how would you really know what is, you know, looking at like this article up here from uh, zero sum, well, this tweet, how would I know that, oh, it's a com scriptlet or is it com plus? Is it kind of like C and C++ where it's like similar-ish but not really? You won't really be able to compile. I also use this GC, uh, C++ in the C and hope it works out well. So thankfully, Microsoft to the rescue, scriptlets are available in both NCOM and COM plus. From what I've seen, it doesn't really matter from what I can tell. You know, I'm sure there may be some differences, but from what I've seen, there's not really much of a uh, distinction between you know, when you would call it com or complex. But like PowerShell scripts or VB scripts, these kind of scripts are ways for us to do some pretty fun things with um, scriptlets. And 
I haven't really seen this attack, but uh, here's a little, um, little fun opportunity. So you can create com objects from a uh, Java class. And so class files aren't, you know, if you were looking through DLP or having your AV flag, they might look for a .sct file. But how many times do developers leave .class files on their machines? How are you going to know that's a malicious uh, intent for a com or it's a developer's uh, file for some kind of uh, Java project? And so thankfully, nobody has JRE installed anywhere in the enterprise. I'm sure it's not 1.7 or 1.8. So that should be working out pretty well for us. So one of the people to really evangelize the idea of uh, com scriptlets, uh, you probably know him as uh, Sub-T or uh, Casey Smith. Uh, he really helped to evangelize the idea of abusing com to uh, you know, cause uh, problems. And so this is all it really is for an SCT file. It's like an XML-based file. And we can see just from like this one line that we're going to create an ActiveX com object uh, with the uh, wscript.shell, like the shell object on the Windows machine, and call calc.exe. As we all know, calc is very nefarious, and it should never be run. So just to quickly show uh, this in action, oh shoot, it's on my screen. I'm not sure what's on yours. Uh, this is a bad choice. There. Yes. So we see that file. We see that script object being called. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be ran here, and very soon we should see. Oh, we're gonna you know we're using the scriptly do uh, method here to call uh, register to register a SCT object, uh, SCT file, and that runs our file using that skibbly do um, method that we have seen probably not really too much more often now, but definitely is still a vector that needs to be uh, thought of when we're having our EDR solutions help us in our environments. And so, yeah, we saw calc.exe as whatever. But you know that could be definitely abused for any kind of number of string objects or you know different a longer string calling all kinds of things to uh, make a scheduled task or do things like delete log files or any number of things. And so we had seen uh, that built-in Windows command uh, utility, Red Server 32, uh, being used to help run that SCT file. And so that's a valid application on our machine because we could use it for a number of reasons for uh, registering objects or we're installing software, we would use that. But again, you know, being abused by attacker, by an attacker, we can see how an SCT file looks harmless, can definitely do a lot of harm on our environment. And here we just, um, well, I, I just kind of broke down that scribbly do uh, command that we saw on the command line. Well, command line, and we saw that it could run silently. Uh, we don't want to, re want to register it on the server. We want it to be registered um, less, so it's not persisted in the registry. And so if we try to uninstall it, it's going to run that object. So it's a really fun way to help remove as less disk activity or less disk artifacts as much as possible. And so the fun thing is it doesn't have to be on our system. We can call it from a bad guy's uh, attacker um, system. And that script object.dll is what uh, helps run those, um, those SCT files. So Microsoft likes to iterate, likes to make things better, easier. Thus was born complex. Solve all of our problems. Like, we can quickly make in a more structured way manage COM in our environments and try to help make this a uh, surface so administrators can help uh, make uh, enterprise type solutions and configurations for our COM environment in the system. And so it kind of gave us a way to better manage COM and to uh, really deal with it. Also, the way fun thing is it had us some really awesome icons. I don't know if you've ever gone to the Complus application. 
uh, administration thing, you see these really cool things like some screw head, a box, and some little like a map pointer thing. And we call it now is like the dropper pin, but you know it's for an interface, and it was really cool. So I really like that. I want to show this with you as well. So if we go to component services on a Windows machine, I'm gonna try this again. If we I'm sure there's a better way of doing this. Come on. So component services on a, uh, is pretty standard on a Windows machine. It gives us a way to help uh, see like a uh, COM plus objects on our machine. So if we look here on a COM plus application, we can see kind of the default COM things we have there. And so we can see uh, easiest, easier ways for us to kind of browse different ways to uh, examine what's available on our system and components there that can help make us um, you know, more locked down and more secure in our environments, but nobody goes into here. I know we forgot, I forgot about this, but it still has really cool icons though. I just have to say, all right. So, you know, we do it once, we do it twice, why not a third time? So let's iterate again, and we'll call it distributed com, DCOM. This helps us not only solve common issues on our machine, but helps us wreck all across the environment. Why not do it at once? So the Microsoft way helps you with it being, uh, you know, COM is more, it's much more easily accessible across the environment than before. So that's just really better for us for attackers. It's not really a background, it's more like a red team focused background. And so like most, most Microsoft things, it assumes you know what you're doing. So that's always dangerous. I surely don't. So the, not only do we have problems with COM and COM plus, but now we have DCOM ways of abusing um, this distributed technology, kind of like with SMB or with SSCM or a lot of opportunities. And so as we can see here, uh, Matt Nelson here, he has a, a script. Well, he has a script, but reverse shell, he uh, kind of weaponized it in a PowerShell script to have this PowerShell script uh, invoke uh, a DCOM based uh, scriptlet that helps um, you know privilege, escalate pri uh, privileges on the system. So that's cool. So we always want to be able to look backwards and integrate with legacy technologies because it's too hard just to you know start fresh every single year with Microsoft. With that, uh, .NET can reach back into COM and uh, help attackers even more. And so from a .NET perspective, we call the uh, runtime callable wrapper that kind of helps manage that way we can interface with COM objects as attackers or I mean administrators and uh, make it easier for us. And so we, um, this is C, uh, C sharp, so it's not C++, I'm sorry about that. But we can see here how we can still use uh, .NET with uh, with uh, com and vice versa we can go from com to dot net and help uh, escalate those kind of attack paths through com which is probably not as well managed or as well looked at from a dot net perspective with uh, EDR solutions so definitely some opportunities there to help really dive into that as an attacker me I just do, do the scriptly do object uh, attack pass and that still works so, you know, we we'll don't have to try harder just yet. To really dig down more into this whole mess of net and uh, .NET and COM, uh, James Forshaw gave a pretty excellent talk last year at DerbyCon, talking about the uh, interoperability of uh, .NET and COM, and pretty well worth uh, looking at and trying to see more how this all works together. And uh, yeah, that's pretty good. So back to C-sharp. Uh, we are really gonna talk about C-sharp this time. So with um, most things with C-sharp, you kind of have to take care of how you increment and how you use objects in C-sharp, C++. 
And so we can see here pretty standard things. If we want to add a reference, if we want to, like, say, create a new object reference to this, uh, to a com object, or if we want to see what's available, uh, options available with this com object, as far as, like, you know, with uh, wscript.shell, what kind of things we can do additionally with that. And so, well, move away from C, C++, that's gross. And kind of easier way to look at this is, you know, again, with the add reference and uh, release. And so, you know, we still have problems with uh, use after freeze, uh, that cost of bugs that still is present today. But, you know, maybe attributed to com objects not having, uh, you know, been properly released and attackers taking advantage of those uh, opportunities for UAF vulnerabilities. But, you know, if we're not able to fix open redirects, we probably should fix the low-hanging fruit first before we start digging into the harder things. As we can see here, we're still seeing uh, use after free vulnerabilities even back from 2004 with uh, COM-based um, problems even today. So definitely some to take care of eventually, but maybe not. So we see that you know, even today, COM isn't really that technology that's forgotten or really uh, a corner case. We're still seeing problems with uh, CVEs like here with, that was just released last month, around COM, that Microsoft still addresses with problems and with uh, opportunities for uh, bug bounties and attackers to help take advantage of this kind of thing. We all look at the shiny new things, but we still have the rotting under uh, belly of Windows still hanging around. And again, uh, James Forshaw, I uh, was like a fanboy, I guess I am of him. Uh, he does a great talk, you know, usually based around COM and how that's being used, like with VirtualBox or even you know, things that you would find in our environment. And so it's not really, they're not really attacks that are so magical or out of reach. They're very, actually very simple, like doing scribbly do or doing uh, PowerShell scripts that help abuse these kind of things that we find in GitHub or even bundled into Cobalt Strike and other tools like that. But com has been around for a very long time. So we go through a period of time where it's been talked about and, oh my gosh, com! And then it goes like, oh, it forgets about com. And then, oh my gosh, com! And, you know, it's kind of like Adobe issues. We still see those. I mean, years ago, it was, oh my gosh, Adobe! And now it's like nobody cares about Adobe. It's still being patched. Just patch it. So attackers, you know, have been using com in a variety of ways. So with uh, HFirefox, with the UAC me, you know, we're using these kind of interface, common interfaces to help escalate privileges. And they still work. So if, it, if it's not broke, why fix it? Right, Microsoft? So as we saw with Forshaw, you know, still using, com, abusing COM, we can abuse things like VirtualBox to escalate privileges. Or even with KC, as I showed earlier, with the, uh, the scribbly do with the uh, COM scriptlet files. And then Matt Nelson, his, talk, uh, his blog article last year about abusing the uh, Microsoft malware uh, interface to um, hijack a server and take uh, privileges over that. Because normally these things that run with COM operate at a higher level with a uh, system or administrator account. So if we take advantage of COM that is already running a system or administrator, it's a far easier way of trying to compromise a user and then try to escalate up through there as well. So I talked a lot about COM, but how can we see COM? From an attacker's perspective, you know, it's not really that hard, really, to find COM-related issues on even Windows 10 issues uh, servers systems today. So one of the best ways to look for uh, opportunities for exploitation is through uh, Process Explorer. It's a free tool by Microsoft. Helps kind of see, like, a running snapshot of a system in action, and you'd be surprised at how many times uh, there's problems with the Windows system just chugging along, but it uh, just really, if you look for paths, what you'll see later on, well, you'll see in this tool, that uh, you'll see medium to high integrity attack paths that really open up, you know, if you were to place, say, an attacker-based DLL at a location that Microsoft expects us to run to be there, Microsoft will happily run that DLL that you supply in the path where it says name not found, and it will no longer be not found, be found, and it will run your DLL. 
And so another uh, opportunity to explore is uh, with our React OS. These uh, people have gone through and tried to reverse engineer uh, Windows to the best of their abilities. So a lot of things that we would see in Windows are also reflected in React OS. And so sometimes com related type things will be in there. It just all depends on what you're looking for specifically. But unlike Windows, React OS is free. And uh, it's also used for a lot of different research for uh, Windows, kernel, Windows kernel vulnerabilities and other kind of uh, system level uh, attack paths that we would find in Windows as well. So that's her, they try to be as mirrored as possible. But again, uh, fanboyism here for uh, James Forshaw. I'll meet him one day. What's going to happen? Uh, his tool of oilview.net. And so, you know, we can look at those kind of component services. We can look through the registry. That's really gross. Process Explorer runs endlessly and finds a lot of things. You know, if only there was a way we can quickly see com goodies like James Forshaw's tool. And so, remember how I talked about the, um, you know, wscript.shell as a prog ID? Well, his tool on this machine in particular found 3,592 potential paths for you to escalate uh, privileges on a system. It's not really like that translates to a one to one ratio of uh, abuse to uh, an interface. But how many times have you gone through a Windows system when you're doing a system hardening or doing a review and like, huh, I wonder if all 3,592 of these common interfaces can possibly be, be exploited like wscript.shell, which can easily run a shell to my uh, system and run calc.exe. So I don't have time. But you know, maybe you do, or you know, somebody else does, that I can look and say, huh, I wonder if number 1,184 can be used to load a DLL, or it could be used to make a system call, or it could be any number of things. And so and really, just playing and time, we can try to see if we find another attack path um, through this interface. Another fun thing is James Forshaw, his tool also can uh, query all these common interfaces at once. And it's a really bad idea. It'll probably uh, cause some pain to your machine, but it's also really fun. Because what's happening is his tool will query all 3,592-ish uh, interfaces at once and try to see what happens. Normally, you would never do that. You would just do uh, wscript.shell or some kind of like a iFile system info to help work with the file system. Never all at once, but a lot of fun things happen. So if you do query all interfaces, hit OK, then have process explorer running at the same time, you filter for a name not found with a high integrity running as a system level account, you can find a lot of fun things like fondue.exe. I don't know if it's a, a path for escalation, what you would use for things like uh, Paul, uh, what's his name, Fuzzy Security. He had a, his uh, workshop last year for DEF CON that kind of showed the different ways you can escalate privileges through this kind of very similar method, and it's on his GitHub, but basically going through the same process where you're looking for a specific set of things with Process Explorer to um, fix privilege escalation issues that Microsoft won't fix. They say it's a design issue. It's also as is. These aren't uh, what they consider to be part of their scope for um, security issues. But clearly, escalating from a user to an administrator to us is a security issue. To them, they see it's a design issue. So um, again, 2,592 on just that one system. I'm sure none of those are bad at all. You know, and so COM, you know, we'll see this summer if any of the big conferences, they show like the next big things. We know we saw last year with uh, Zero Sum is uh, Poetic, the uh, COM uh, CNC. So this is all, uh, this is a purely COM based um, command control server platform like Cobalt Strike built in COM. I mean, listening to his talk and kind of seeing through his code, you can see there's a lot of pain associated with that because we're not really used to having to deal with that pain. We see it abstracted many layers above 
with PowerShell or much more friendly ways to consume those COM interfaces and use that. But you know, at the time, he demonstrated how you know, this is a new attack and using these kind of methodologies, EDR products weren't really tuned to look for those kind of things. And so, I mean, I'm sure, hopefully by now, it's been a while, that these kind of signatures could be based, developed to help detect these kind of base activities. So MITRE also has their attack uh, framework that really ha breaks down really in a pretty well fashion uh, different attack paths, different kind of scenarios that help you as an organization uh, simulate uh, attacker activity. So a lot of these things also take advantage of COM. So sub T is like the fountain that never uh, stops of knowledge that helps give out new ways of COM attacks. So does Matt Nelson and James Forshaw's um, bug tracker for Google. Excuse me. Constantly talks in depth about the different ways that um, you know, what's wrong with the file system or what's wrong with Windows, how this was abused. And so just mining that information for gold is pretty easy. Just, you know, focusing on COM as an attack path is um, probably here to stay. But, you know, it's one thing to have these tools available, but it's another thing to run it as well in our environment. So if we were to run things like squibbly do or, you know, the Kuwaitic uh, COM stuff or the reverse shells, invoke decom, PowerShell script, you know, can we detect that if we're, you know, are we running these things in our, our environment under a, a structured uh, way that we are expecting it to be detected, hopefully, or not? You know, I think as us as red teamers and pen testers and, you know, security analysts, we should also be using these tools that, you know, we think, ah, oh, calm, that's dumb. Maybe it is. I don't know. I like it. But if we're running that and it works, is it so dumb because it works, but you know, are we t catching these things with our products? And so maybe we're seeing when a tool, comp-based tool runs that as good privileges, we see maybe uh, not, so helpfully, not so helpful alert bubble up that we think, oh, it's probably a false positive. So I think really if we run these tools rigorously, we can kind of see our analysts and our blue team really try to catch these kind of things that attackers aren't going to help. Hey, I'm an attacker. I'll be uh, testing your environment here next week. I'll be running these tools. Go ahead and check them out too. So I talked about a lot about Red Team. That's what I like more. But you know, Blue Team's also cool. You know, Justin would want me to say that as well. So you know, Blue Team they have a really hard job. You know, everybody says, oh, we've got to succeed once, and Blue Team has succeed a hundred times. That's true. But we can do a lot of things as well as an organization to help really push that along. I mean, by default, Windows 10 is way more secure just inherently than Windows 7 and Windows 8. So if we're not really trying to push the ball along to get our environment up to Windows 10, latest uh, version, and Windows Server 2016, and I'm sure 2017, and 20X, I mean, that's just going to help by default, stop a lot of things that we take for granted in older environments that things are, it's always been there. So you know, these tools are always present and running still that are locked down or better secured in our environment. So with SpectreOps, S-T-E-R, the T-E-R, the device guard uh, profiles really help us to lock down and prevent those kind of attacks that could be easily stopped. So if we can get a lot of free help from Microsoft by, well, free, it's all relative with licensing. If we get a lot of free help with that way of having these kind of device uh, to guard profiles, that could block a lot of these kind of things. It could stop a lot of different vectors and help us to really, um, you know, stop for free things we take for granted. As well as, I'm a huge proponent of this, is PowerShell command line auditing. So this is a great thing because attackers, if it works simply in the environment, they probably might, might not catch it. You know, if I run PowerShell and I do things to uh, bypass all kinds of things and run command lists. If I have auditing and I'm looking for these kind of different events on uh, the command line, I can quickly alert and tell the blue team or analyst that there's bad things happening. So I 100% endorse PowerShell command line auditing and reviewing. That's really the key word, and reviewing. For auditing and nobody looks at it, there's one to do something good. 
but also, you know, back down to the platform itself, the system itself, we should use at least version 5 whenever possible. It just makes it harder for attackers to take advantage of the inherent weaknesses of earlier PowerShell versions. So if we're funneling them to higher versions of PowerShell across the environment, that's going to help us do a lot more things, be more aware of what's going on in our environment. But if we're doing the auditing and we look for a dash com object, how many times do you think users ever in their life open a PowerShell and then call a com object? Probably 0%. So an attacker will probably be the person doing dash com object, wscript.shell, to make a point or attack or leverage some kind of, of attack without doing any ossification from like Daniel Bohannon or any of those other tools out there to help mask that. If they're trying to you know, see if this is the easiest way possible and it works, why would they change? But if we're auditing that, we can quickly pick up on that. And so also, there's uh, engines out there called WScript and CScript that can help run uh, things like .NET, um, James Forshaw's tool, .NET to JScript. So these are JScript type files that help us do very similar things with usually com-focused attacks that help uh, run these JavaScript type uh, scriptlets in our environment. But how many times do you think there is a serious need and a constant need to have these binaries even available on a system? You may think, oh, it's been there for since 2000. It's probably needed. Well, probably not, but until you do testing, and remove these capabilities that attackers usually get for free on a system like CScript, you know, do you really need this enabled? And you can live without them. And uh, also, shout out to uh, F Pieces over there. He has done this in his environment and lived to tell a tale, whereas the environment was still running without these uh, things in the environment. I'm not saying go ahead and delete them or, or uh, block them, but just kind of start exploring those kind of paths where you take away attackers easier tools and force them to use tools like version 5 or other kind of attacks that could be easy, more easily detected and monitored. And, you know, as like uh, Justin talked about today with uh, Sysmon, you know, a sim is great, but you know, if we have more capability with uh, Microsoft's focus of uh, Sysmon, I mean, why not? There's a lot of great guides out there that help really uh, push this product along, help us get better visibility with uh, our environment. So if, you know, if possible, try out Sysmom. I mean, there's not really, I can't think of a downside of trying that and see how well it works in the environment and see if it's picking up gaps that we're not seeing as well. Another tool uh, that just recently came out by Microsoft is called Broad Project Fast. So from my understanding, it's very similar. It's still very much early. They're taking uh, beta clients now, but uh, definitely more insight into attackers uh, type attack activities on a system and help us to bubble that information up to attackers sooner and faster. So, COM, unfortunately, is here to stay. It's not like, uh, you know, VBScript where we axed that and got uh, PowerShell. You know, we can still run uh, VBScript with things like CScript. But if we force them to PowerShell and other ways that are more uh, caught, that's going to be helpful for everybody. And so, you know, there's still a lot of different parts of COM that we can talk about today. Things like uh, treat as, the things like uh, talked about with um, Matt Nelson, different attacks that he leverages, and things like monikers of how different kind of um, interpretation of COM and the environment. And as mentioned earlier, with uh, the exploits, they're not really exploits, they're just taking advantage of bad design decisions that Microsoft won't fix for whatever reason, but still work and give us what we want in the end, so who's winning in the end? So if we can really help as a community by exploring more of these objects rather than the wscript.shell and the file system objects, kind of explore the other thousands of com objects that could perhaps be even easier for us, I think as a whole, as a community, we could be uh, even stronger and more secure. But you know, not everybody takes the um, idea of comp seriously, like Adobe. I mean, we have Adobe, Cold Fusion, making comp objects. It's already bad enough with Windows, and then we have Cold Fusion, comp objects. I don't know. I'm sure it's secure, and it's, I'm sure it's fine. All right, so for more information about comp, 
Um, my blog there has some uh, com articles on there with our research and uh, some slides. So uh, reach out to me through uh, Twitter. I also have a Slack for uh, folks, in, uh, you know, mostly based in uh, Omaha, but feel free to join as well. I was looking for more members and to uh, talk security. And um, are there any questions? I got a question. Sure. Um, you showed, well, I think pretty early on, there was a, like a, a way through Com to, to execute a Java. Is that yeah. Java class, is that just like handing it off to a, a JVM that's already installed or? It's like an SCT, but yeah, with a JRE using that to, you know, using a JRE to call that class object or okay. class. So like, cause like the JRE would be installed by default typically. But do you have JREs installed in the environment? Right, so if you do, then it's adding that com object? Well, it's like a SCT file if you have it on the disk and then, you know, use JRE, which I'm sure some of us have installed. Okay. You know, using that, you know, fixing them together for another path forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's more like common Windows and like PowerShell going forward, but it's like this bubbling problem, kind of like mm -hmm. ours, if they're using right now, but it's kind of bringing it out to the light that from MSCN that we saw that, oh yeah, you can use Com from Java as well. I'm sure that's probably fun, but it's not really probably explored or even probably talked about. I'm sure it is explored somewhere. Yeah, I had never heard of it. My... Yeah. Yep. What do you lose? What functionality that's that? What useful functionality would you lose if you disabled COM on workstations throughout enterprise? Well, COM is kind of like the like framework underneath everything. So but you can turn it off. Turn off COM. Disable it. Okay. So do you know what you'd lose or? Uh, well, how would you disable COM? Uh, through that fancy. COM Explorer or the component services. Yeah. Well, that's just the uh, COM server, but you could do like the, regis the registration of the registration free of COM objects with the SCT file that would still run the interface that lives in the registry, or it runs. Yeah, you know, so yeah, COM. There's things that you lose, but you can still run COM things. If I don't, you know, if I'm understanding correctly, and, but, but. and is, would there be any trouble turning it off as a? Sure, I've really explored that option, but you know, it's definitely worth exploring and see if that I mean, would if help. If it's bad, turn it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anybody else? How many prizes? So I'm sorry about that. All right, thanks.